and uh, put together this audiobook and then opened up um, the Pet Loss and Life Transitions Counseling Division of um, my private practice. And I've had so many people come through it. And you know, people who love animals are just wonderful people. They have such big hearts. And uh, sometimes, you know, your relationship with the animal, um, the animal gets closer to you, particularly for people that have had trauma in their lives and particularly growing up, that that animal is the closest being to them, that no person do they feel as safe with as they do with their animals. So when they lose them, they can be very distraught and have a number of um, dysregulation symptoms, both physically and psychologically. So um, the work I do with the pet loss has just been wonderful since the brain spotting came along. And I really enjoy working with those, those people so much. Oh my gosh, that's so good. You know, I was having a conversation with my daughter, Brittany. We have two dogs at home and oh. one of them is uh, our Australian, Australian Shepherd mixed mm -hmm. with, we don't know what, you know, <laughs> wah, wah, we have no idea, yeah. but she's just amazing. And then, um, you know, I have to go to Texas for two months. I'll be going to Texas for two months. We have three horses oh, that we just wow. got. So they're oh. out there. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Our yeah. family has expanded. Yes. <laughs> And so, oh, yeah. And she said, you know, Sandy was our, our little dog's name. She goes, you know, she's getting old now. And that just struck me. It's like, oh, no, she's not getting old. She can't be. And, um, you know, it just made me think, oh, oh, no, we can't, we can't have Sandy getting old. So I'm like, I'm putting her on my own supplements, Mighty Maca and some fish oils. I'm like, I'm not letting Sandy get old, but I definitely know that attachment, you know, know that attachment, feel that attachment and just that, that consequence of, of fear, of, fear of loss, let alone loss. I've had dogs all my life, animals mm -hmm. all my life. And so you want to see that just like with people that they live a good long life, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And they can be our absolute best friends, our companions. And we know that having a pet increases longevity, increases our hormone oxytocin, is just powerfully yes. healing. Absolutely. Um, that oxytocin is, is just huge. I mean, that, that's coming from our mammalian brain. We, you know, we share with, with our animals. And um, uh, that's the thing is people usually feel great um, when their animals are around or if your dog is on your lap or your cat is, you know, curled up um, on your legs, whatever. And uh, that oxytocin is a serotonin agonist, you know, it, it boosts it. And so um, this is a great way to, to really feel good. And I think it's been really helpful for people with the stay at home to shelter it in place, that even though they've had um, such a struggle with not being able to see in the flesh, um, family members, coworkers, friends, whatever, that they have their wonderful fur, fur and feathered kids, you know, right there. I think that saved a lot of people. Um, and uh, I think they do. A lot of people say when they rescue an animal, um, they'll say, no, that animal, uh, that rescue dog me. rescued me. <laughs> I have heard right. that too. I have heard that too many times. And um, yeah, that's powerful. Talk about the stages of grief that a, a pet owner goes through with their pet too. Sure. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, everybody's different and the order of the, the phases are kind of can come at any time. But um, first is usually shock or impact, as uh, Elizabeth Harper Neal calls, uh, calls it. And this is where it's that protective part of our brain in the brainstem that kind of dissociates us from uh, feeling in a way that we're kind of, we don't have words. That's where sometimes when you're at the vet's office and you find out for the people that find out in the moment, they bring their pet in and it's this bad that we need to do it now. And they weren't expecting it. They find something that's going to go very wrong very quickly. That kind of shock, they can't take in then the information. It just shuts down our thinking, executive function, part of our brain. So in the early phases with a loss or an impending loss, um, an anticipatory loss, we'll find that our cognitive functions aren't as good. We'll be on the road, driving somewhere that we go too often and go, whoops, I passed the exit. 
or we're looking at numbers, uh, you know, in our work that usually we kind of bang them out like this and all of a sudden it's like, what? We lose our place, we lose time sometimes. So this can be a period of time that really makes life difficult for people. People understand it more when it's a human who has passed or if there is an anticipatory phase or a hospice phase. And then um, there may be the sort of um, waking up to, oh gosh, you know, th this really happened and really feeling the day-to-day -day impact. So that you'll, you'll look in the corner where your dog is usually rolled up, you know, like a little, little donut in their bed and they're not there. You know, maybe you've left the bed there or you think that you hear them. And um, that reality sets in and then the feelings start to come in and maybe even flood that it, some people even feel like I, I, I can't do this, you know, without my sidekick. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully as time goes on and you get some time to reflect that it's your particular reaction to the loss. It's everybody's reaction is different. What is that it that um, comes to you as sort of a personal growth issue because we all face loss. How is it we can be a better us because we have this dear one who it is our contract that they go before us because they have the shorter lifespan. So this is a place where I work with clients uh, a lot when they get to that phase of what is it that, you know, it's almost like you would do for a person, the, the living legacy of even an act in your life. Maybe they go and volunteer at a shelter. Maybe they don't, uh, donate money to uh, the ASPCA or um, Soy Dog or one of these organizations. Um, and then being able to move to actually being able to look, look at pictures of your animal and feel the wonderful um, times that you had together. I mean, it's been many years now and my husband will say, remember when Yoko used to do the race car around the, the dining room table? We didn't know what was the, the front end and what was the back end and she was going so fast. and. Um, you know, we'll laugh. And so that's when people begin to integrate and be able to move forward. And, um, uh, you know, I think you can flip flop into any of those phases. Uh, you can uh, maybe hear a song on the radio or someone brings a picture to you of you and, and your new baby and when the dog was a puppy or whatever, and oh, all of a sudden you feel that moment again of this more searing pain, but it's more fleeting. So that's kind of an overview. And so when you're experiencing those kinds of sensations in the moment of experiencing that, what is a uh, quick um, intervention that we can make or a quick um, practice we can participate in that will help us with that overwhelming feeling of grief when we're experiencing that? Mm -hmm. And I just want to say for those listening, you know, pet lovers and animal lovers and, you know, understanding that it, like we can always say in general, never compare your grief to someone else's. Acknowledge your feelings, what you're experiencing. And I think when we bottle it up, try to hide it, we have a much more traumatic recovery period than when we just recognize like, hey, I'm grieving my dog and it is not, you know, um, it is not weak. It is not petty. It is not, you know, whatever it is. It is real for me. And that is, I think, an important thing to acknowledge as well. Would you agree, Deb? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's the wisdom of our brain body connection that when that comes, we should uh, allow that. I know it doesn't always come at the most opportune moment, but finding a place and a time where you can have those feelings, whether you do go to see a, a pet loss or grief specialist, uh, counselor, um, or somebody who, who really gets it and understands and knows and you can talk about and you can cry and you can tell them how you feel that, you know, the, the tears that we cry when we're, we're sad and we're grieving have a different chemical makeup than when we're slicing onions and say, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm all tearing up here. And so it's a way that our body wants to release and it's a very human and natural thing. It's a mammalian thing. We see these incredible videos of um, uh, elephants, you know, gathering around and, and grieving around one who has passed, you know, and we're starting to, to see some of these ways that uh, animals grieve. Um, and so moving with the feeling in the moment is the best way to help things move in a direction where you can get to the better feelings in time about the wonderful memories and the original reason that you got the pet in the first place.
Yeah. And I think that's, you know, recognizing that, that, you know, they say animals are your, can be your best friend. Right. And I think especially now having pets when, especially when we have this physical distancing and this more prevalent social isolation, that having pets are, are just so beneficial for our health. So let's, let's switch and and let's talk about brain spotting. So recognize we can use this in grieving our animals and grieving the loss of our current regular daily life and our daily existence. And as we uh, are now entering this as, as it's termed period of uncertainty, this time of uncertainty, like we're, there's a lot of tension, energy and, and concern around that. And especially now the news is, oh, well, we're increasing, we're seeing the rates of, of, of COVID increasing and, and it's creating some fear driven uh, reactions. And in fact, one of my colleagues, a medical colleague in Italy is, is talking about the fear that's gripping his nation, g- gripping the nation of Italy. And it's also running oh. into legislation with, you know, almost like a force of putting smartphone apps, tracing people and, you know, say, hey, if you're around someone who's been recently diagnosed with COVID, you've come within 20 feet of that person. So this tracking software that goes with us everywhere we go, and um, that uh, risk of limiting personal freedoms and how that's really gripping, it's further gripping the nation um, in fear and what we can do so we don't go there with that fear-driven physiology so that we can stay very clear, very I would say, what do you know to be true right now? What is your reality showing you? How many people do you know who have been sick and how have they recovered? What is, you know, what is, what are the underlying reasons? What are things that we can do to decrease our risks right now and make that next right step as we face our, um, you know, the reality that we're in right now? Absolutely. And, and actually being a person that is in, uh, uh, lives in, two of the states that have actually gone down. I think uh, um, Governor Cuomo yesterday said we had, quote, only 17 cases. And of course, 17 people, it's never, never a good thing to have one, but we have gone down from thousands and we've done the social distancing, the masks, and then the, um, uh, uh, the phased reopening. So within that, each person's feeling about what's right for them. Something that we do in brain spotting is called self spotting. And what we can do is to notice when you had mentioned when you're in a difficult place, whether it is with um, the grief of a pet or uh, what you're dealing with um, with COVID and uh, maybe getting invited to an event and not sure if you could should go or not and trying to figure it all out. If what you can do is notice kind of where your eyes are in the moment, that's probably a little bit more of a, it's a little bit resourced, but there's some activation there around what you're thinking about. Notice what you notice in your body with that. There might be a clenching, your palms might be sweaty, you might feel a little dizzy or or dissociated, kind of unplugged, disconnected. And then see if simultaneously, even with that going on, can you find a place in or on the body that is calm, centered, grounded, or if you say nothing is, how about neutral? And it could be anywhere at the tip of your nose, deep, deep, deep in your elbow. It could be anywhere. Or if someone says it's not even neutral, none of it's good, how about the less bad place? Uh, Lori DeGrappo, who is one of my uh, supervisees in brain spotting, wonderfully came up with that phrase, um, the less bad place. And most people will be able to feel that, uh, that, oh yeah, over here feels less bad. Then let your gaze um, be guided by that and see if you can find the place for that. An easy way to do is just look one corner for a while, the center for a while, the other corner, see where you're drawn, and then look for the specific spot. It might be looking at a little vase or it might just land on something on your wall and spend time on the spot that feels better even though you have this activation that doesn't feel so good. This helps your body come back to a homeostasis because our brain wants first survival. So anything perceived as threat is gonna be on the alert and our uh, amygdala is going to be assessing and then seeing whether it's gonna contact the parts of the brain that get the cortisol going. 
um, and the survival program's running, or it's going to back down and say, okay, this is all right, I'm going to homeostasis now. And I even feel better than that, I'm going to restoration. So it's the three, survival, homeostasis, restoration. So we wanna go from that threatening survival place to helping ourselves naturally, um, psychophysiologically, neurobiologically with the visual field, finding that spot. And it may sound a little odd, but it's the time on the spot. And we have a couple of theories about why that is um, from a, a neuroscientist and a psychologist um, that we're working on seeing if we can get some um, uh, proof of this when we can get back together again to do more EEGs, fMRIs, these sorts of things. But what people tend to notice usually is that their system will start to settle because our brain is an organ of organization. It wants things to be in this homeostasis and restoration area. It, it only wants to be here if the threat is bad enough that we need to save our lives or a loved one's life or deal with something that's dangerous, and then it wants to come right back, right back to this homeostasis. And in our world, our complex, complicated world, and now with COVID and these different phases we're going through with it, um, there's a lot of this survival stuff going on for people. So to help ourselves to get, to get the attentional, where the attention goes, the brain, the mind, the body goes. So if we can find that place that's even just a little better, or is actually calm, grounded, and centered, and find that visual spot and spend some time there. It's like a kind of meditation, or you could add this piece in with the meditation that you already do and already utilize. So that's a suggestion. And so finding that spot, that spot where your eyes are naturally going and mine go to the left when I start thinking trauma, upper mm -hmm. left. So that trauma, that activation center, mm -hmm. I've noticed this a lot more since I've known you, you know? Yeah, yeah. oh, good. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like, okay. And then just to, to chill, to meditate and to go into that space. Okay. I think that's awesome. Where am I, you know, what feels calm? Where, you know, where am I feeling calm or what area is feeling calm or less bad? I kind of like that. Like if you yeah. feel completely <laughs> tense what feels less bad and, and then getting into the state where you're able to take that deep breath to shift your physiology and to do things regularly to keep your physiology as healthy to you know relax get out of the cortisol the sympathetic stress fight flight mode that we're definitely exposed to right now and can experience I, you know sandra wrote in from from facebook and she says that you know her dog is very anxious doesn't want her mm -hmm. out of her sight doesn't want her dog her dog doesn't want her mama sandra out of her sight and right. that in fact when she tries to take her out the dog is very very nervous because is that feeling her energy her nervousness or you know the dog is nervous during mm -hmm. you know having social anxiety right now too fear and i i guess this is a new thing that she's new. seeing mm -hmm. she hasn't seen it before mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, the dog may be very empathic, very sensitive. So whatever she can do to help calm herself down, and even I don't really know technically how to do Tellington T-Touch, but just from bilateral stimulation, if she can sit her little dog on her lap and do like one little circle on one side, like the shoulder, and one little circle on the other, and just alternate those, we have bilateral sounds we use in brain spotting that helps to get both left and right brain kind of um, uh, flowing again. Mm -hmm. Because when anyone, a dog, a person is in a very anxious state, it's a particular neural network that hooks up. And it's like the parts of the brain that say, hey, things are actually okay here. They can't find a way in. They're knocking on the door, but they can't get there. So that this bilateral stimulation can help. I don't know whether a thunder shirt, if she feels like something like that at this point, or there's even these little pheromone plugins that you can get from your vet that will help your, your animal calm down. But it might be a good significator for her to just take some time for self-care for herself and then notice what happens with her dog. Mm. You know, and it may sound crazy, but the ways that she talks to her little dog, sit him down and in a nice quiet voice, tell him, tell him how 
he's okay, she's all right, that things are gonna be okay, that uh, whatever you would do like with a little baby or whatever, that was kind of fussy. And just to try some of these things. And also for herself, it's really fine to distract yourself too from, you know, maybe get a good series going on um, uh, on Netflix or um, pick up a book that you haven't uh, been able to get to. And, um, you know, that self-care and then a little of maybe some of these things with her dog might, might make some movement, a little shift maybe. I, I like that idea. So um, you say where you look affects how you feel. Can right. you give us a little exercise so that we can do that with you in this, in this Absolutely. learning this technique? So why don't we do the little um, resourcing that we were talking about in the self-spotting, we call it the body resource. So we'll just uh, uh, take whatever, five minutes or so. And if people listening um, can just take a moment first to notice what maybe feels a, a little bit stirred up in themselves. They just, just have an awareness of it, maybe where your eyes are now. Just say, oh, okay, they're there. But well, given that, I'm gonna look around now. What feels calm, centered, grounded? And it could be anywhere. Or maybe it's just neutral. Or maybe it's that less bad place we talked about. It could be, again, tip of your nose, your toes. It could be your feet on the floor. It could be anything. Notice how the chair is supporting you or the couch, wherever you're resting. And then once you get that, just look to one side of the room, like the corner. And you're gonna see what has the resonant feel of this thing that feels better. Give that a, a little bit of time and then look to the center. Notice if you're looking for that resonance to what feels, even if it's just a little better. And then look to the other side, the other kind of corner of the room. And then if you have been able to find that third of space, just look within that space. You can either just move your eyes kind of horizontally, and you can look up and you can look down, or maybe there's something that draws you in the room, a favorite object. And when you get that sweet spot of what feels the best, most calm, centered, grounded, or neutral, with a less bad place, just take about two minutes there. We'll just take a little time and then we'll check in when you're done. So I'm just gonna be quiet and you're just gonna take that nice quiet time for yourself on that visual spot. And I think what I find that's so interesting yeah. as I get into this experience is, is just that, that consistently that upper left area or kind of, you know, maybe uh, 60 degrees above um, horizontal, just mm -hmm. that, let's see, I would say it's like at 11 o'clock, 10 mm -hmm. or 11 o'clock. And that that's just consistently the space that, that I want to go to. Does it mean something one direction or another? Because upper right is kind of tense. Mm -hmm. you know, upper left is much better, which is interesting. And again, getting in tune to this area of, what is it? Yeah, sure. Yes, in, in brain spotting, it doesn't. We look at this, that the brain has four quadrillion possible synaptic connections in any given moment. And that's from Daniel Amen of the Daniel Amen Clinics um, and his work uh, with um, thousands and thousands of SPECT scans and other 
uh, scans of the brain. So um, what's going on at any particular time, given uh, the feelings, giving the thoughts, the body, the history of that person, um, their temperament and personality is going to be completely different than someone else. I know there are certain systems like um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, that have certain meanings, and that goes flows within their whole system. So maybe someone who does that might might find there's something for them in that that um, uh, uh, shines some more light for them. That's great. That's fine. We say brain spotting is very inclusive. It, it wants to include anything that works for the person. So um, it just uh, kind of it is what it is and David Grand will say we don't have to know what it is to know that it is what we see happen clinically and people really getting excellent benefits from the work and how they feel and that um, journey inward and what resonates inward that deep kind of self-knowledge of what works for oneself because we're such a culture that's so um, product oriented and what have you done for me today or you know that to go oh, and yeah. Hide, yeah and to uh, really feel okay within yourself um, sometimes there's a lot of polls to take care of whatever on the outside and to get a good centered foundation and base first is is so important for us and especially in these terribly uncertain times so I hope this can be uh, helpful to people this little exercise yeah yeah, and think that just that realization where you look at how you feel. So getting in touch with that within yourself, getting into this rest state, identify, if I make sure I got these steps right, Deborah, identify what feels calm in your body or the, what feels best in your body or less bad, however you look at it, what feels best in your body and get into the state feeling comfortable and then affect your, and then use your gaze, you know, and um, come to the center, look to the, you know, upper right, upper left, down, uh, lower right, lower left, wherever that may be, and see where your gaze feels. What are you expecting to feel? Like for me, it's just that relaxation, less tense, I would say. Great. Yes, absolutely. It, it's just that simple. And each person will, will do it um, uh, differently. Um, they'll find a way that works for them. Some people are like, whoop, it's right there. They know immediately, you know, they have a really good sense. Some other people will say, I don't know, it all sort of feels the same. That's where we say, just guess. Because when you guess, you're using your subcortical brain and that's what we really look at in the brain spotting. That's the part of the brain, not only where the difficulties will lie, those kind of patterns, but also where the regulation is. The regulation isn't in our executive functioning analytical brain. It's actually in these areas that are right behind the orbits of the eyes. It's the midi, middle prefrontal circuits that have deep connections, dense neural connections down to the amygdala, the alarm centers, the hypothalamus, then to the, um, down to the adrenals for cortisol, and down to the brain stem to an area where all our survival programs are fight, flight, freeze, faint, mm -hmm. um, dissociation. So um, yeah, if we can uh, get that sensing of where in the body and just, just guess if we don't know and just spend some time there. That's... Um, can be really, really helpful. And the more you do it, the more you'll get so you, you know where the spot is, even if you don't know in the beginning. It's like anything. When you exercise the muscle, you get better. Yeah, yeah. And then I think one thing that you talk about, too, is that the existential trauma versus trauma shock. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. These are uh, David Grand's terms. So he's the developer of brain spotting. That existential trauma is something that we either all experience at the same time, like a, a 9 11, the, the effects and what that means for us, um, or um, COVID, which is totally pandemic worldwide, but even things like school shootings and things that happen that it's like my child could have been there or my nephew could have been there, um, you know, other um, uh, events that we, uh, that we go through. Um, this uh, now, of course, the Black, Black Lives Matter for um, individuals of color, um, anytime they hear, you know, someone has been killed all these times that we have had, what that brings forth for them. And of course, many people who are, you know, allies or who really understand uh, the depth of that, uh, what that means, that um, the existential trauma is that um, shared deep depth of something that is um, terrifying, 
terrorizing, but also can mobilize within us forces to combat um, whatever it is that we are experiencing. So within that can come the trauma shock. That's the phase in the beginning when we were talking about the first phase of grief. The trauma shock is when the trauma happens and we, uh, or like when we're in shock, we will go through those. Some people will go into a fight mode. Some people will go into a flight mode and some people will just freeze or feel dissociated. Um, uh, and then various along the way with COVID, there, we get new information and then there's maybe a new shock with it. So the two kind of together are sort of resonating, but each person is so individual in the way that they react. Of course, given their individual history and their history with trauma. David Grand says that a trauma that happens in the moment wakes up all the other traumas going back to the original trauma, and that, in fact, may be implicit unconscious memory. Because when we're birthed to almost about age three, certainly 18 months to age three, we don't have the part of our brain online yet that makes episodic autobiographical remembered memory. And it sounds crazy, implicit memory, but that's body um, uh, visceral sensing that we feel that that's what a baby feels. Mm -hmm. And to them, it's not crazy that they don't remember, oh yes, yesterday grandma held me this way. They can't make that memory and it feels good again today. But their body is making that something that, mm, they're starting to make those neural connections of, ooh, that's a good snuggly in. You know, the, the amygdala isn't just giving us the, um, the things that are terrible. So based on our history, we're each gonna have a reaction within that, we're all feeling the existential trauma. And sometimes we feel very differently from other people about what's going on and how to handle it. Um, and uh, to give yourself a break regarding this trauma shock business, I mean, we're out of the original shock of it, but we are still in this, oh, if I did get it the worst on a continuum, the worst is I could get it or someone in my family or close to me could possibly pass away. Mm -hmm. I mean, that does wake up our system an awful lot to, to be on alert. And um, so we may find ourselves vacillating between these various defensive survival states of, again, the fight, flight, freeze, and don't forget with the freeze, this dissociation, don't be hard on yourself. We don't know it because it's dissociated. This is again, where we have that implicit going on. It's un unconscious. We don't consciously remember it. It's we're out of time and then we go, whoops, 40 minutes went by. I was supposed to call so-and-so and then we feel so badly, but we're, we're out of our normal way of everything, of being, going to work, seeing our family, getting groceries, every single thing. So just have an appreciation for what your poor brain and system is trying to put together and be gentle with yourself and don't expect yourself to be perfect. Don't put that extra stress on yourself in this time where there are a lot of trauma signals mm. that can and be firing. Yeah, no, I understand that. And then just, I love, you know, the term perfectly imperfect. Yes. <laughs> it can be perfectly <laughs> imperfect if we have right. a perfection complex, right? It can be yes. perfectly imperfect. Yeah. So that's really good. So um, in summary, just some of the things that you recommend people to do during this time, right? To uh, take us out of this mm -hmm. fight or flight mm -hmm. zone or, or to just like, redirect that trigger to calm, like, as you say, calming the alarm centers. Right. Certainly that little self-spotting uh, body resource exercise we did with finding that place in the body that feels the best and getting the eye position that's resonant with that, that feels the same with that. That's great. But anything you can do, put on some music you like, dance around the room, move your body. Sometimes we get kind of frozen. We don't even realize that we've gotten um, frozen in a way that just moving, putting on a song that you like, you know, some Aretha or some you know, <laughs> dancing in the streets, you know, with um, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas or for the summer here um, to get your body in motion. Maybe do yoga, maybe you do Pilates, um, play with your kids, 
you know, um, do, do what you can do with them. Get outside, play with your dog, throw the ball and run after it yourself. <laughs> See if you can get to it before your dog does. But <laughs> any of these things, like I said, watching a series uh, that, you know, maybe you haven't been able to get to on Netflix, read a book, even consider one of these like Babel. I, I always wanted to learn Russian. Well, get on Babel and start learning it. Do something to a little bit to push yourself outside your comfort zone of, uh, uh, I'm not sure what to do here. Pick up something new and do it. What about some artwork? What you, maybe you used to draw, maybe you collaged. Cut some stuff out of magazines and glue them together. Make a little card for your friend. One of my friends and I are writing old fashioned letters to each other and sending them in the mail, like Love we it. used to when we were in our 20s. So I think anything that you can do, use your creativity, get on Zoom with your friends, have a Zoom virtual dinner or a cocktail party if it's okay for you to have a cocktail. Mm -hmm. you know, so. I love this. And how can people work with you? Because I know we connected virtually also. Yes, absolutely. Um, they can go uh, to my website, which is petlossaudio.com. And my email is basically my name, D for Deb and Antonori, A-N-T-I-N-O-R-I at Gmail. Um, and you can also find me um, on the Brainspotting website, brainspotting.com. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you oh. for your, gosh, so much helpful resources and information. It's so helpful to have this and be able to share this information and just kind of recognize that there are small little techniques. Our body is designed to um, act, react, and then rest and being able to trigger those areas, knowing that we have reset points within us. Right. And, you know, uh, one of our listeners commented, um, acupressure, deep yeah. breathing, and these yes. are reset points Absolutely. we can use. We have at our resource and this brain spotting and then being able to use it also therapeutically, like we've used EMDR and emotional freedom technique. And I think this is a really powerful, powerful technique. Thank you for introducing it to me, Deb. And thanks for all your work you're doing with pets too, and grieving from pets. And I, I appreciate you very, very much, very, very much. So brainspotting.com, one way to find you and find out more about brain spotting. And then also your website, petlossaudio.com. Right. Thank yes. you. All right. Well, Good thank to you see so you. Much. You too. Thank you. Thank you all our listeners for being here. I appreciate all of you and I'm excited to continue to share information with you in our Girlfriend Doctor live podcast series and, and continue to share this information and write in your question, topics that maybe you need help on, extra help on, and know that I am here for you because I am, after all, your girlfriend doctor. Thanks for being with me today. And again, please be shared this, inf share this information and check out, practice these practices yourself and let me know how you're doing. Thanks for being here. See you next time. Hello everyone, Dr. Anna Kabeca here, your girlfriend doctor. I am excited to be with you today. And as you know, we've been working on a series, working through trauma, working through grief, going from post-traumatic stress to create post-traumatic growth and post-traumatic resilience so that we are stronger no matter what we're facing in our lives. So today is one of these episodes where I wanna share with you a technique taught to me and very, very helpful. You've heard me talk about EMDR or emotional free technique. This is called brain spotting on the same principles, but recognizing how we can tap into that reset zone of our own body and our nervous system to get into that re reset zone and just reboot, control cortisol, increase oxytocin. Today, also, we're going to share a little bit about grieving our pet's and the benefits of pets, but also understanding that it is, there is a grieving process that we go through. To bring you this information, I've invited a beautiful colleague, Deborah Antinori, who is a licensed professional counselor. She's had over 29 years in private practice, and she is a brain spotting trainer as well as a certified consultant. She's been using brain spotting since its inception in 2003, so over 17 years. 
and um, she has been practicing. She's also a grief therapist, and she holds a fellow in thanatology from the Association of Death Education and Counseling. She authored a chapter on grief and brain spotting in The Power of Brain Spotting, an international anthology. She is the author and narrator of the double award-winning audiobooks, Journey Through Pet Loss. That is just a fabulous, fabulous resource, Journey Through Pet Loss. She's also a master's graduate of NYU's drama therapy department. So very excited to bring her to you and talk about grieving, pet grieving, as well as this brain spotting therapy, this resetting that we can do. So here we go. We're going to jump right into the middle of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> 